So now for the program that you've all been waiting for. Today's alumni college session, Sustainable Innovation and Startups, Affecting Change Through What We Produce and Consume, will run for about 90 minutes. Our speakers will each present for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for Q&A. So let's go ahead and get started. It's my honor to introduce Ben Rankin, class of 1987, and Ron Shigeta, class of 1989. Ben is a project developer and a principal at Human Capital Investments. He earned a BA in English from Reed and an MBA from the University of Washington. Uh, in property development, he emphasizes affordability, preservation, and community building. In manufacturing, he focuses on energy recovery and materials recycling. Ben has been a thea uh, theater director and producer and taught at Presidio Pinochet University, or Pinchot, pardon me, Presidio Pinchot University. Uh, Ron is a serial entrepreneur and startup biotech pioneer who started his career in biochemistry research and transitioned into biotech startups from genetics to synthetic food proteins. He holds a PhD in chemistry from Princeton University, where his academic research covered secondary metabolic biosynthesis, diabetes, genomics, genetics, and structural and systems biology. Ron has worked with more than 100 early stage ambitious startups across gene therapy, diagnostics, precision medicine, synthetic biology, food, and agriculture. Ron is a guest lecturer on food innovation for the Center for Food Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Business School at Santa Clara University. He's also helped to establish the world's first community college program dedicated to synthetic biology at Laney College in Oakland, California. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Ben. Thank you. Great, thank you, Amy. And um, real pleasure, of course, to be here and uh, to be part of this panel with um, Ron. What we are uh, intending to do is to um, talk first about the production side of uh, sustainable intervention opportunities, and then about the consumption side. And Ron and I have very different backgrounds and areas in which we work. So uh, we're starting with production, which is um, which is part of what I do. Uh, I um, part of my business is to find ways to intervene in heavy industry uh, in ways that reduce the energy consumption or the materials waste that goes on in those industries. And uh, I'm going to, um, I, I wish we were all in the same room together so we can have a conversation about it, but uh, I'm, I'm just going to run through some slides and uh, uh, I, I hope that we have at least a good chat afterwards and other opportunities to connect later. So uh, I'm, uh, as Amy said, I uh, graduated from Reed with an English degree in 87 and um, have found my way through all kinds of interesting uh, projects in the in about the opportunities that I've, I've seen or uh, have had shown to me in uh, materials recycling and reuse and in energy capture. Uh, talk a little bit about the capital markets, if we have time for that, and how capital can get deployed in these kinds of projects. Talk about some of the obstacles uh, uh, that that keep these projects from getting getting done. So, uh, I work in industries that are massive, dirty, and old. Uh, as an example, we um, are involved. My company is involved in a, an acquisition and turnaround of a paper mill in the Northeast, and it's a very small paper mill, which means the paper machine is 100 yards long, but only about eight feet wide. It's about 20 feet high, massive amounts of water, five tons an hour of paper produced. And this is really quite a small industrial facility. And many of you may have plenty of contact with heavy industry. You may be well aware of these kinds of, uh, of um, I think the thing that continuously um, excites me about getting involved in these kinds of projects is the scale at which one can intervene. And in every industry that I've I had an opportunity to look at or touch, steel, oil and gas, um, there, there are tremendous opportunities to save energy and tremendous opportunities to reduce materials waste. And uh, just a few random examples, for instance, if you have a lumber mill, um, you typically burn a lot of natural gas in a boiler, you make steam in that boiler, a high pressure steam, you then need to step down the steam pressure get it to the level at which you can use it to dry your lumber. And you do that by uh, uh, bleeding off the power uh, through a pressure reducing valve. 
So energy is just wasted at that pressure reducing valve. So first of all, instead of gas, you can put in a biomass boiler and use all your mill residuals uh, to make energy instead of using natural gas. And secondly, you can replace your pressure reducing valve by putting in a back pressure turbine and basically generate power. A lumber mill can probably generate enough power to feed 500 or 1,000 or even a couple of thousand homes on a continuous basis just by, by that one step. Um, and I could go on about each of these industries and you know, a wide variety of opportunities in, in them. Um, but I'm gonna to focus today on cement and on pulp and paper because we happen to have a project in each of those areas that, um, that I can speak about more specifically. So first industry, cement. Um, you can see uh, on the screen a map of the cement plants in America. This is a little bit uh, in the US, excuse me. Um, this is a little bit out of date. Um, they're roughly 100 now. Some of these have closed, but uh, you can see they're scattered fairly regularly throughout the country. That's because cement is a low value commodity. A ton of paper might sell for $1,000. A ton of cement sells for maybe $100. So um, um, what that means is you don't make cement in California and ship it to New York. Um, you, you make cement in California and use it in California. Um, so plants are scattered evenly throughout the US. Uh, they're, they're big beasts. Uh, cement is the, as many of you presumably know, cement is the um, material which causes concrete to set. So um, you basically throw an enormous amount of limestone in a kiln, in a rotary kiln, big long tube, and you rotate it at 1500 degrees by burning a lot of coal and uh, you get um, um, cement out the other end, or rather you get clinkers, which are these big boulders, which you then grind to make the cement powder, which gets mixed with water and, and gravel and sand to make the concrete. Uh, there, there are a lot of opportunities in the cement industry. Um, uh, I myself um, spent a few years running an industrial recycling company uh, in which we relied a lot on the cement industry to take the materials that we were finding elsewhere. So boiler ash from biomass boilers like the one I described at the lumber mill. Um, you know, pulp and paper mills often have big bonds of the, of the silica and the ash um, that comes out of those boilers. Uh, also, um, um, blast grit from blasting ship hulls or bridges. Uh, you can, that, that has a lot of iron content in it, and you can use that to feed a cement kiln. So opportunities to basically keep materials out of, uh, out of the landfill and, um, and, and beneficially reuse them while displacing other virgin materials that would otherwise be, be used. Um, uh, there are also um, intergrinding inter opportunities um, in the cement industry. You can use um, byproducts from the steel industry to displace a certain amount of cement. Uh, so instead of having to make a million tons of cement, you only make 500,000 tons of cement, and then you use $500,000 of steel slag uh, which was produced up the road at the local steel mill. So lots of interesting opportunities there on the material side, but I'm gonna focus on energy. Uh, a typical cement plant can use waste heat to generate up to all of the power that they consume, up to all of the electricity that they consume. So I'm working on a project right now, uh, have been for a few years uh, at a US cement plant. I can't name it because we're under NDA, but it's a project to do the first waste heat recovery system at a US cement plant. There are, um, uh, I think substantially every cement plant in Japan and hundreds of them in China use this technology and others around the world and in the US, it, the number is zero. So we're trying to get that to one in hopes that that will then become 10 and 20 and 30. Uh, there are a number of reasons why it doesn't happen in the US, mostly economic. Um, I'll touch on those a little bit here today, but, uh, but um, it's, uh, it requires a, a third party developer uh, that sort of outside resources to come into the plant to actually get one of these projects done typically. Um, so this is uh, an example of the project. The project I'm describing has not yet been built. We're hoping that it will start construction as soon as August or September. Um, but you see here a cement plant, this is in China. Um, the big tower is called the preheater precalciner. You can see a, um, kind of a brown tube along the bottom. That's the rotary kiln where the, um, the, the calcining actually happens. That's a big tube that goes around and around and um, cooks at 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, 
a, a retrofitted waste heat uh, recovery project where you come into the mill and you stick this technology in later um, uh, requires these big ducts. So you can see the shiny ducts, which obviously have gone in recently in this case, you know, done after the plant was built, which is what we're doing also at our uh, project. Um, so you have these big ducts which shift the airflow that's otherwise just going out the stack. It shifts the airflow, routes it past some heat exchangers, which cause water to boil. And then that, that's the steam from that boiled water gets run through a turbine and, uh, um, and, makes, and makes electricity. Um, this is just a site view of the, of the plant um, with, uh, you know, there's a turbine building and there are various fans, which we have to, um, which we have to track. Uh, so here's some statistics about this particular project. And I, I'm gonna pause for just a moment and say, my intent here is to do just a little bit of a high level of overview of the kinds of work that I'm doing. Um, there's all kinds of detail, of course, on any particular project, um, but, uh, but I, I chose to do just, just a little touch point on a few different kinds of things that, that I do to hopefully give people a flavor of it and, and um, you know, spark some conversation around particular industries and possibilities and issues. So this particular cement plant um, that we're working on uh, uh, currently uh, has two kilns. Uh, they operate, as you see, uh, 7,700 and 7,800 hours per year. If you're a, a project developer or operator of a big manufacturing facility, there's an important number, which is 8,760. That's the number of hours in a year. And so um, uh, if you have if you want to staff your plant, for instance, 8,760 hours a year, you need four shifts, you need four crews of people. Um, uh, so if you have 10 positions, 40 employees to, to cover that plant. Um, in this case, the kilns have uh, run an average of, call it 85 to 90 percent of the time. Um, this plant, uh, this, um, this waste heat recovery system, which uh, we're working to install, will be just under 20 megawatts. Uh, it'll run, it's expected to run 95% uptime, which means when there's heat flowing to, the, uh, to the, the, um, the turbine, the turbine will be operating 95% um, uh, of it. Uh, it'll have a 74% capacity factor and to geek out on electricity for a moment, that's a very important uh, uh, figure um, because uh, megawatts are not all the same. Uh, for instance, a uh, 100 megawatt solar facility will generate 100 megawatts about 15 to 20% of the time. So its capacity factor will be in that 15 to 20% range. So it will have that 100 megawatt facility will only average maybe 15 or 20 megawatts over the course of the year. Um, so that when you're thinking about power, you have to think about what the capacity factor of the facility is. And so one nice thing about this type of facility is it's, uh, it's not truly base load energy, but it's near base load. It has about a 75% um, capacity factor. So what that means is it'll average 15 megawatts throughout the course of the year. Another interesting thing about this project um, and about this kind of project in the cement industry is that in addition to generating power from the steam that's produced by the waste heat, you can also save power at the facility because the air doesn't have to be moved around as much with fans. And I'm not an engineer, um, and I'm not gonna try to fumble through an explanation of why exactly that is, but essentially you have a significantly reduced fan load. Um, so there are, in addition to the megawatts generated, there are negawatts. Um, so there, there's uh, energy reduction, in this case, estimated at another 20 million kilowatt hours per year. And in the case of this project, that's pretty significant because it'll save the plan about $1.6 million a year um, in, in avoided energy cost, in addition to the economic benefit of the power that's being, that's being generated. Um, so uh, the last uh, number on here, I, uh, a life cycle analysis when you're calculating um, greenhouse gas reductions is a very delicate matter. Um, it's squishy. It's not always reliable. People tend to sort of beat their chests with that number and, you know, put it out there, oh, we're saving the planet with X. Um, the, uh, I think, fairly reasonable assumption about this plant is that it will offset 2 million uh, metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions over its lifetime. That, I believe, is assuming 63,000 tons per year over 30 years. But, for instance, I think this, the 
um, substantially all of that benefit or the vast majority of that benefit is coming through assumed avoided cost by not having to generate electricity from fossil fuels. And so I think we all hope that um, the marginal electron uh, in 20 years is not being generated by a coal plant or a gas fired power plant. Um, uh, so whether, whether the need for this project is as great at the end of its useful life is, is as high as it is now, I think remains to be seen. So ultimately it might not be 2 million metric tons, but in any case, a fairly significant amount of, of, um, of uh, greenhouse gas from this project. Um, and again, just to sort of um, contextualize 20 megawatts um, is 20,000 kilowatts and a typical Amer American household consumes an average of one kilowatt continuous um, you know, throughout the year. And so this represent at 74% capacity factor. So at 15 megawatts average, it's kind of like turning out the lights uh, in 15,000 homes or turning off the power to 15,000 homes. Um, so that's sort of the scale of project, which, you know, compared to a big solar projects, you know, these 400 megawatt solar projects, which might be five times this size, six times this size, um, you know, it's not enormous. It's called industrial scale, not utility scale but um, it's still a very satisfying project to work on. Um, this is the power production model. There are a couple of things I wanna mention about this kind of work. Um, many industrial processes are continuous. Many of them are batch. An example of a batch process would be, um, uh, for instance, an electric arc furnace, a type, a type of steel mill that runs scrap steel instead of um, iron ore. Uh, that furnace, that, that the, um, the heat that's generated at that facility is very intermittent because it's a batch process. They fill up the ladle and then they zot it with a lightning bolt, basically. And so uh, 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 because it's a batch process, that means that the amount of energy that we can then go and capture with this kind of system is intermittent. And so the capacity factor is much, much lower. And so it becomes much harder to do a project. So a continuous uh, process like a cement kiln or like a, a pulp and paper, like a pulp mill or a paper mill are, are good places for us to intervene. We, we really want to find um, facilities which are operating 24 seven. And then in addition to whether it's continuous or batch, we wanna know whether it's a stable or unstable facility. And that can be both economic stability. If we put in a wonderful 20 megawatt facility and then the and power plant and then the, the plant closes two years later. Well, that's, um, we didn't accomplish what we wanted to. Uh, um, there's also the issue of process stability. So if it runs 24 seven, except that every two days it goes through a 12 hour outage because it has to, you know, it has an upset condition. Well, that's, that's also an issue around our ability to generate power um, continuously. So these are the kinds of um, challenges that we tackle in any industry. Um, the second industry I wanted to talk a little bit about is, um, is uh, the pulp and paper industry. I'm just doing a little time check here, excuse me. Um, uh, and uh, so the pulp, this, this is a, an image of a pulp mill in Brazil. Um, you can see some farmed trees around the mill and you can see the logs stacked up there and then they're being chipped in, under that big um, V-shaped uh, cover and um, the, the, the um, angled uh, conveyor takes them into the pulp mill. You can see a bunch of um, uh, you know, equipment there, um, the, the chemistry and, and the big tall boilers over there. Um, and you know, just, just all extracting uh, a fiber from the, from the logs. Um, so in the pulp and paper industry, there are an enormous uh, number of opportunities to, to do the kinds of projects that I do. Um, Typically, we ask what's going in, what's getting wasted, and what comes out uh, when we look at any particular facility. So when you think about what's going in, well, what kind of alternate feedstock um, can we use? So for instance, with the, um, the, our paper mill in, in the Northeast, um, it has historically used virgin fiber. We want to switch it to recycled fiber. There's also opportunity for agricultural fibers, which I'll talk about a little bit more shortly. You know, as, as an alternate way of, of, um, of getting the feedstock you need for your, for your paper. You can also close the loop on water, try to not waste water, um, which also saves electricity because you're not uh, pumping as much water. Uh, there are 
frustrating issues like uh, wet lap versus dry pulp. Uh, a pulp mill typically uh, makes pulp, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, and then it, um, uh, and that pulp is, is wet, and then it dries it to these quite dry bales, ships those dry bales to a paper mill, which then uh, gets them wet, you know, slurries them up again. Um, so you dry it and then you get it wet again, which is both a waste of water and a waste of energy, enormous waste of water, enormous waste of energy. And so, you know, uh, uh, there used to be something called wet lap pulp that was widely used. So the pulp would come out at maybe 50% moisture um, instead of 10% moisture. The problem with wet lap is that if you have to ship that somewhere, you're shipping water. And with a global supply chain, you don't want to ship water from Brazil to China. So um, uh, it's economically inefficient, but uh, environmentally problematic to dry pulp. Uh, consumers have a big role. Uh, their consumer choices, for instance, um, we're just, we just take for granted that our Kleenex are white, not brown. Our napkins are white, not brown. Uh, we have for a long time, we're getting better about that. But um, the consequence of getting white instead of brown is a lot of chemicals and a lot of energy to go through a bleaching process. And um, it's, it's purely aesthetic. There is no functional benefit to, to bleaching paper. Uh, well, <laughs> there is a functional benefit when you're talking about graphic paper. Um, of course, uh, a dark brown paper would, would, would not be, would be more difficult to, uh, in, in with graphic paper, but there are all kinds of paper applications where you really don't need, um, where you really don't need uh, white, white paper. Um, I talked about biomass boiler ash recycling earlier. Another thing we used to do was we would take um, tissue sludge from, um, from uh, plants making, you know, towel and tissue. Uh, we would take it to anaerobic digesters um, on dairy farms in Wisconsin because they needed additional fiber to go into their anaerobic digesters so that they could um, power their dairies with, uh, with uh, a combination of dairy manure and other materials like this virgin tissue sludge. So that was a fun one to work on. Uh, the specific project I want to talk a little bit more about is Columbia Pulp. Uh, it's a project I've been involved with now since 2014. My initial role was in um, um, helping the executive team figure out how to get the project um, developed, which means um, getting all the contracts for uh, offtake agreements with people who are going to buy the pulp and contracts with farmers to supply the feedstock. And I'll talk about that a bit more. Uh, basically getting the whole project assembled and then getting it financed. So up to the point where we got financing and worked really intensively on the project, then I could step back. Uh, however, my business partner and I did set up a business which supplies all of the feedstock to Columbia Pulp so that it can make its pulp. Uh, the pulping process is a, um, a process of separating the fiber, the cellulose, from the lignin in typically trees. Uh, it used to be all kinds of materials, but since the late 19th century, it's just been trees or substantially only trees. That's the only material that gets pulped. Um, once you've separated the, the cellulose from the lignin, you can now take the cellulose uh, and, and run it through a paper machine and use it to make different kinds of paper. It's a very water, energy, and chemical intensive process. Um, there are integrated mills, and an integrated mill would be a mill which makes pulp and then put, runs it through a paper machine right there, and then maybe even goes on to the next step, which is to make a product. Um, uh, so, take, so a paper machine creates a big roll of paper at the end, and then you have to, you know, uh, convert it in some way, you know, you cut it, you laminate it, you, 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 you might uh, uh, put color on it, you might emboss it, all kinds of things, depending on what the particular end use is. So in the meantime, there's this pulp industry um, chewing up lots of trees, using a lot of energy, chemicals, and water. In the meantime, uh, there are millions of acres just in eastern Washington state alone and northeastern Oregon uh, of, wheat, of wheat being grown. And wheat is grown uh, with, com uh, it, it's harvested with combines, as you see here. Uh, it leaves a stubble behind. In this case, the combines are shaving it fairly low, so the stubble is, is fairly short. But um, the farmers will set their combine head as high as they can get away with 
because I mean, get away with as in um, still capture enough grain because um, uh, they don't, they want to run their combines as fast as possible uh, with as little wear as possible. So you're left with standing stubble in the field and you have three choices. You can burn it. Uh, so when you have standing stubble in the fields, that gets in the way of your next planting. If it gets in the soil, it, um, it is hard to, to plant again um, because it creates a mat in the soil. Um, so in very dense wheat growing regions, regions where the wheat grows very thick, say um, 60, 80, 100, 120 bushels per acre, uh, you are uh, looking for ways to get rid of your straw. And in Eastern Washington, for a long time, the solution was burn it. So you just set your fields on fire. You put a big flamethrower on your tractor, you drive around, you set your fields on fire. You could also till it under. And in theory, you can bail it off, but if you bail it off, you need to do something with it. So uh, you, you, don't want, you, you can't have straw bales sitting around in the field anymore. You can have uh, straw stubble. So um, burning it obviously has a greenhouse gas impact um, as well as a air quality impact. Um, tilling it under, you end up with, um, with soil erosion and um, you know, soil health problems. So bailing it off is a very good solution in certain conditions, but you need to find a, an outlet for it. So the Columbia Straw Project, excuse me, the Columbia Pulp Project was set up specifically to replace trees with wheat straw as the feedstock to make paper pulp. Uh, and a technology was developed, a process was developed by some researchers that creates, uh, for to the best of my knowledge, the first time, um, a, a pulp that has um, technical attributes which are con uh, comparable to hardwood pulp. Uh, uh, tr uh, traditionally, pulp made from straw or from agricultural residuals has been lower quality, it's been weaker, it's been shorter fiber, um, it's been, it's, it's, it's been dirtier, it's had, it's had a number of, of problematic technical characteristics, which is why it hasn't been used. This process is making good quality pulp, and so it becomes, um, it becomes a, a, a reasonable um, a alternative to, to making pulp from, from trees. And uh, there are other agricultural residuals which you can do this with. There are some folks in the southeast now in Florida who are trying it with sugarcane bagasse, which is the byproduct of, of um, pulling sugar out of the stalk. Uh, there are other straws, uh, possibly corn stover, although I'm skeptical about that one. So um, uh, straw pulp uh, can be used for packaging, um, for molded fiber, which is, uh, if you think like china plates or egg cartons, that sort of thing, for towel and tissue, uh, for graphic paper, a, a recent edition of the Reed Magazine was um, uh, printed on paper, uh, which uh, uh, was made with straw from Columbia, with uh, pulp uh, from Columbia pulp, uh, so wheat straw from Eastern Washington. Uh, here you can see a coffee cup that was made with some Columbia pulp. pulp. Uh, one thing that I think is really important that I try to um, ask myself regularly is, is it worth it? And Columbia Pulp is a greenfield project, meaning um, it's not a retrofit like that cement plant project that I was talking about earlier. It's a greenfield project, meaning the top photo is what we had before and the bottom photo is what we have now. And um, so uh, when you get in the developer space and the developer headspace, of course it's worth it. Everything is great. It's going to work out great and, um, and the outcome is going to be wonderful. But uh, you know, there are um, uh, environmental impacts that come from attempts to, to, um, to make an environmental impact with, with changing a process. So um, in this case, uh, I left out of these photos, um, there's some big transmission lines and there's a um, grain silo across the street. There are some other impacts already on this landscape. It's pretty dry, um, very dry. And um, so, you know, one might argue not an unreasonable place to put a facility like this, but um, always worth asking the question. And um, I'm sure there are many people who would uh, argue for uh, justifiably that uh, less consumption is the way to go or different consumption, which is what Ron will be talking about um, soon. Um, uh, so uh, I think uh, I'm gonna, I, I, I could talk more about the details of, of project development, um, uh, you know, how it gets financed, uh, 
um, you know, ways, ways uh, uh, obstacles, frustrations, opportunities. But I think um, I think I'll I'll leave it there. I've, I've used a half an hour of your time, and I think um, what Ron has to say um, is going to be an interesting uh, um, counterpoint. I hope to 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 this conversation. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, I um, appreciate everybody's uh, attention and interest, and um, I look forward to hearing what uh, Ron has to say. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, so, uh, as Olga's put uh, in the chat bar, if you have any questions for Ben that are fresh from what he just said, put them in, in the chat and then at the end, the Q&A, you will be asking questions of both Ben and Ron. So I'm going to turn it over to Ron Shigeta, class of 1989. Take it away. Thanks, Amy. All right. I will just jump right into it. Uh, oops, where's my... Oh. I had to reset my, I lost my uh, presentation somehow, right? Uh, but here it is. So um, I usually give this talk because I speak to food industry people all the time. But today, this is the title of my talk. We're going to be talking uh, about some of the work I've done and some of the work I just watch. I, I work with some of these companies, I've not worked all of them. Um, and it's kind of turned into this very interesting uh, phenomenon and an opportunity to sort of study how we might actually create some social action around uh, climate change, which has always been a sticking point. I'm gonna briefly go into, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the climate models because they're not completely settled, but this is a couple of just some numbers to sort of wrap our head around food in broad strokes. This is a cartoon from XKCD. Oh, pardon me, Ron. We can't see your slides for some reason. I wanna... Really? I can't. Yeah. All right. I'm not Sorry. sure what happened there. Oh, no, it's I just right. thought right. I'd right. intervene right, right away. <laughs> well, I do have my thing there. All right. Can you see them now? Yes. All right. Thank you. Maybe I'll. Hmm. Okay. All right. All right. So this is the first data slide or presentation slide. Basically, this cartoon just tries to grab to graph the percentage of live uh, what land animals and where they come from. Uh, each square represents a, a million tons of land mammal on the land only, no sea. And then the, the black squares are people uh, and the gray squares are uh, agricultural animals uh, and domesticated animals. And then the green squares are all the wild mammals on the face of the earth. Uh, agriculture now consumes about 95, 97% of the, the land that it can on the face of the earth. And fortunately we're reaching sort of a leveling off of, of population, but still by 2050, the, the demand for food still supposed to increase by 30 to 50%. So there's crises that are unrelated to climate change just simply from population, a lot of pressure there. But the climate change numbers are quite relevant. They haven't been universally recognized. When Stephen Chu, the science advisor for the Obama administration left the White House, he did an audit on climate uh, greenhouse gas emissions and his he went on a speaking tour we basically wanted to remind everybody that food and agriculture are responsible for just as much emissions as petroleum and transportation and so i made this little chart to talk about the numbers uh, in terms of our average consumption as americans the average american eats about 160 165 pounds of meat between pork beef and chicken a year that's about half a pound a day. And because animals in particular, uh, animals in particular have a huge impact because every day that the animal's alive, they need to have water and they need to eat. And so the longer the animal lives before it is harvested means that the, the impact is multiplied uh, geometrically by the length of the lifetime. And so beef in particular has a huge water and CO2 impact. Animals emit a lot of methane which is 70 to 80 percent, it's after 80 times the impact of, of CO2. And so if we sort of total up an estimate from this, uh, you know, this is just a simple addition that I did from these numbers of consumption reported by the USDA, you can sort of see that the CO2 impact from our average diet is actually larger than our average emissions from, uh, from, from driving annually. Um, and so animal agriculture in particular uh, from the food industry is a real, 
a real focal point for, for the talk and, as, and the interest to climate change in general. Okay. So what I do is I work with startup companies and I work with a whole new breed in particular of startups that are working on the problem of, of agriculture and food. And I'm gonna talk about three different approaches to replacing meat in this next section of the talk. The first picture here is a, is a promotional picture of the Impossible Burger. Many people have heard about it, but it is a plant-based burger. It's made from, from plants, but it has a little bit of biotechnology in it that it is uh, a small amount of heme is added to it. This is the molecule that's produced in the blood that makes it red, that transports oxygen. And it turns out creates a very distinctive taste of red meat. And so the Impossible Burger was created by a Stanford professor who left his job to create this company, to create this burger that would really change people's opinions on, the, the, uh, on, on the eating animal meat, right? And to produce a product that essentially has no compromise, that people can switch without really changing any of their habits or giving up any of their uh, any of their sort of like memories or tastes in terms of food. This is a huge idea and he's not the only one who had it. Uh, in general, this is, uh, this, there's three kinds of technologies that sort of take this idea and run with it. Uh, well, first is plant-based foods. These are just simply recipes, but we're using the best of food uh, technology that we have to make recipes that are basically uncompromising in terms of the experience of eating the product. So this is, uh, these are some of my friends at New Wave. Uh, we work with them to make this plant-based shrimp, which they, they, it's actually several ladies who started this company and they, uh, they produced this shrimp in about four or five months of hard work uh, in the accelerator I was working on. And um, uh, I'm just gonna tell you a story that the food is also just incredibly transformative socially. And that's, we're gonna spend the last half of the talk talking about that. But uh, this stuff is, uh, was not just simply uh, a greenhouse gas impact sort of product. There, a bunch of rabbis showed up and they came in and they were completely excited because there is no shrimp, there's no shellfish in this food. And so they, they, were, they were basically so excited because they felt this, this is kosher. And that meant that Jewish people around the world can sit down at the same table and eat the shrimp, the shrimp salad along with everybody else, right? And that's why this, this product is so interesting, right? Is that these food, food is never simply something that we eat. It's not a functional product. It's not never really a commodity. It's a highly personal thing. And that's what one of the reasons that there's been such so much momentum around this thought. Uh, so there has been an internationalization that was like, oh God, that was like five or six years ago that that picture was taken. And now there's 1100 plant-based food companies around the world Startups are just cropping up on a monthly basis. There's all kinds of newsletters and news networks around it. And uh, Asia is adopting it. So the, the two companies at the bottom produce Spam and Yakaniku beef that are vegan. Uh, Juicy Marbles is a Slovenian Eastern European company that's making the first plant-based steaks that they're selling online. Uh, the Knot Company and uh, Futura Farms, those are uh, Brazilian, those are South American companies and they're all selling hundreds of millions of dollars worth of value on a semi-annual basis. Uh, so what's really amazing is this concept is translating across all these different cultures and exciting a lot of people. Uh, and that's just given a tremendous momentum to the idea. The second technology I'm gonna talk about is uh, molecular food. This, these are foods where uh, a protein food is replaced by protein that comes from a different source, but it's exactly the same proteins. So yeast in, uh, in yeast in fermentation culture will produce the same eggs, for instance, that are found in egg whites, and they can create egg whites that are exactly the same as the egg white you might separate from a yolk in, a, in your kitchen. Brave Robot is um, uh, ice cream produced where the lactoferrin and lactalbumin uh, from the milk. The milk proteins are actually produced in fermentation. They're not made by a cow. So their greenhouse gra gas profiles are basically negligible compared to producing uh, from the animals. 
Um, and the products are really identical because they've been built, but they've been built molecule by molecule to emulate the foods that we know and love and without compromising the experience. The third class of technology I wanna talk about, the third big idea in this category is the idea that you can make the meat cells outside of the animal entirely. This idea actually uh, that we know of was first mentioned by Winston Churchill about 50 years ago. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it was 46 or something like this. Uh, they, he, he wrote a speech and just said, well, let's not grow a whole chicken. Let's just grow the chicken breast. Uh, and medical science has caught up to us, caught up to Winston Churchill's ideas. And there are several companies, including Memphis Meats here was the first uh, about five years ago that was funded. The whole idea is that you can just take a syringe and pull some cells out of a fish or a, 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 pork, a pig or a cow, culture them outside the body, and then reassemble the muscle cells to create the meat. The, on the upper right hand side is a piece of uh, salmon nigiri that was made uh, from salmon cells by a company called Wild Type. This chicken breast and uh, Memphis Meats did a dinner and fed about 30 people chicken and duck breast that they made from cells, so no animal was killed making that dinner. Uh, so they can produce very con convincing cuts of chicken. Those chickens are gonna, that chicken product's gonna be available commercially for sale at the end of the next year, is my understanding. So these sound like crazy ideas. They are, uh, this is a movement sort of been going on for four or five years and it's actually coming up on us. But um, I wanna share a very strange thing about the, some, some strange things about this sort of food technology. One of them is that unlike petroleum technologies and other things, we really didn't see any problem from the established industry partners. Some of them weren't really excited about it, but some of them really were. And so these are, these are career changing moments for me. Uh, Dave McLennan from, uh, from Cargill, the world's largest meat company, uh, went on Fox Business News to talk about how his company had invested in Memphis Meats. Uh, Tom Hayes was the CEO of Tyson Foods. He, he, he went on Fox Business as well and just and, and, and gave a huge interview. Uh, and basically he was just sort of saying, we don't wanna have a Polaroid moment. We wanna be in there too. And so the money and all of the, all of the know-how and all of the experience of industry is amazingly behind this as well. And they're deeply involved. And they continue to be. Both of these companies have sprouted venture funds that have invested broadly in the hundred or so uh, lab-grown meat companies that are, uh, are scattered around the globe right now. So since that time, there has been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of different developments. It's almost I like to compare it to the emergence of the automobile, um, as you might sort of uh, know it from. Uh, oops. Uh, from the early 20th century, there's, there's at one time, there's 300 car companies in the United States. Uh, right now, there's about 50 or 60 meat companies. Right now, uh, the meat companies are trying to make whole cuts of meat. That's the latest development. And then soon there will be commercialization going on. This is a company called Super Meat in Israel. They produced a proto they, they built a prototype restaurant with a set of bioreactors in the back. You can sit in the restaurant, eat a chicken sandwich and watch the chicken being produced in the back. That's the concept. Unfortunately, you cannot buy this chicken sandwich right now because uh, the USDA, the FDA and other regulatory in, in, uh, agencies in every country are still looking at how do they regulate this? How, how does quality and safety sort of uh, is defined for these kind of new products? They've been used in biomedical research for quite a long time and in growing pharmaceuticals, but uh, for food, they want a whole new set of rules. Uh, the main exception is Singapore. Singapore as a country is only about, I don't know, about 18 kilometers wide, 20 kilometers wide, and uh, they want to be food independent and they have set this as one of their national priorities. And so they have uh, actually fast, fast pathed the production and growth and sale of a lab-grown chicken product through a restaurant there just this last year. And uh, now there's, it's actually available for home delivery occasionally, not all the time. And so uh, things are changing on a, a, 
if you're in the scene, it's changing on a monthly or weekly basis in terms of what's going on. There's a lot of excitement about this and, uh, and actual progress as well. I'm gonna say there's, there's a whole nother level beyond this. Uh, food is changing everywhere because people are seeing opportunities, not simply in terms of uh, uh, sustainability, but in terms of uh, all kinds of product innovation as well. This is a molecular whiskey by a company named Ellis West I've worked with. Uh, they decided they were gonna really try to understand fine spirits and produce this whiskey without any fruit or any fermentation at all. And it, you know, it, was, it was tasted favorably uh, in the Wall Street Journal recently. Um, and just another example of the kinds of creativity that's sort of happening here. Uh, I know everybody has, this is a big transition for people's mindsets. And of course, whiskey is something that we all want to enjoy um, uh, in terms of its quality and all the variety and diversity of the product. But there's another interesting thing too. You have an idea like this, and what you see is that uh, is that it can also create democratization as well, right? If you can produce something that's as good as a hundred-year-old uh, Remy cognac, like, and it costs like five hundred dollars a bottle, but then you can sort of just give that reproduce that taste and then give it to everybody. It sort of allows other people that experience and changes the rules of scarcity and status. Uh, and there's something to be said for that in terms of uh, allowing people to experience all of these things uh, as well. Okay, so I'm gonna switch off this camera and I'm gonna turn on to the food cam. And uh, I have a few things to show you. Oops, how do I turn that off? I'm going to. So if it would be helpful for some of you to pin this particular food cam um, so that it's the, the main view that's open for you. There he is, Ron's food cam. So make sure to pin that one. Okay, so <laughs> we thought it'd be great to uh, show you my backyard and show you some of the food that we're talking about. So I'm gonna just show you the meats because they're all commercially available right now in a grocery store near you. Uh, here's three uh, uncooked patties that I made this morning for you. One of them is uh, a Safeway Select uh, Wagyu beef at about 850 a pound. Another one is the Beyond Burger, which is made, uh, made with, uh, with uh, like coconut fat, and potato proteins and soy protein uh, and is, is covered, colored by beet juice. And the third one is the Impossible Burger, which is of course colored by heme, which has blood. And I'm gonna give you guys a second to take a look and see if you can guess which is which. Hey Ron, I'm just gonna interrupt for one moment. This is yeah. Olga. I'm hearing from people, yeah, that they can't see you. So right now your can't regular you. camera it's not showing up for everyone. If everyone just takes a second and looks for Ron's food cam as one of the squares, yeah. okay. you can also click on the participants and there we go. Okay. Now we should can see it. Everybody see it? All right. I did there spotlight for everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we figured it out. That's great. Thanks, Amy. So here's our three burgers. They all cost about the same. Actually, I have to say that the Impossible Burger just dropped its price to six fifty dollars a pound. And the other two are almost about nine to ten dollars a pound. So Wagyu beef, Beyond Burger, which is sort of colored by beet, and then the heme-based burger, the Impossible Burger, are there. Does everybody have their guess? Okay. So th this you can see the large white particles here of sort of solid fat. That's a that's that's the Beyond Burger. So and you can sort of see that the the, the color is not quite as the same as is the other two. And so that's the, this is colored by beet. That's the Beyond Burger. Uh, this one here is the Wagyu Burger. And this is the Impossible Burger. It's a little hard to tell these two apart. If you actually touch them, you can see a lot of difference in the texture because uh, plant-based burgers being made out of plant protein, they are not, uh, they're not held together by the tissue the way it would be in a meat. And so they feel, feel quite greasy. They're the same fat content as the, as the sort of wagyu beef, but they sort of feel greasy because the, the grease is just sort of in there. But when you cook them, it turns out all right. Okay, let's take a look at the, now I'm gonna have to do the same thing with the cooked burgers. 
Okay, so there's three burgers. Well, they are not as sticky, so they're not, they're sliding around a bit. I'm gonna turn this down a little bit. There's three burgers. And uh, they actually, you can tell that they're fairly distinct, but they actually taste pretty good. They actually taste pretty much the same. Uh, has everybody got, uh, everybody got their thoughts? All right, so this one is the most distinct looking one. That is a Beyond Burger, as you can sort of see, uh, because it's, 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 a, its formulation is such that it actually browns and colors differently. The heme itself, in the hemoglobin in the blood, they oxidize similarly, but the plant-based protein actually sort of browns a little differently, but they taste remarkably the same. And what's really interesting is the Beyond Burger, uh, the Beyond Burger and the Impossible Burger, they actually continue to change the formula, become more realistic over time. And so this is the third and the second versions of the impossible, the beyond an impossible burger. Here's your Wagyu. As you can see, oh, it looks beautiful inside. There's a nice red bloody center. And that's the impossible burger. It's pretty legit. Okay, uh, I'm gonna show off one more thing. Uh, here's the bottle of the glyph. I just, you know, when I do professional uh, talks about this, uh, everybody loves to have a taste of this. It, it's pretty good. I, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go for a thousand dollars a bottle in 20 years on, on online, but uh, it's a pretty credible whiskey and it's, a, it's an amazing feat for what's called sensory science. All right, let's go back to the talk. All right, great. Hope that was fun. Uh, I'm gonna just, I've got a few more minutes and I'm just gonna talk about something that's a whole of interest. We're gonna talk, now that we've talked about what's going on, let's talk about why is it going on. Uh, there's some amazing things that are going on here. And one of the things I think all of us care about climate change knows that it's been really hairy, right? I mean, I think uh, it's been fairly clear that global warming is gonna happen for about 30 years and it's been very frustrating and slow. And we can sort of point to the lawmakers and we can point to big industry. But the fact of the matter is that people, all problems like this are people problems. And so the social aspects of what's going on with food, it makes it a very special opportunity. I'm going to talk to, about, talk to you for a moment about that. So, Ron, yes. uh, I don't know if your slide's supposed to be showing, but it's not um, appearing on our view yet. I think it's the same thing that happened last time. So hopefully okay, we can let's try it again. OK. OK. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Great, okay. So this is, um, I brought in some neuroscience. This is, a, this is a study on branding. And so these three brain scans are, um, are teenagers who love to drink Coke, drinking Coke. In the, on the left-hand side, they're drinking Coke and, uh, and, uh, and then it's subtracted out the difference between drinking water. On the, on the right-hand side is the difference between drinking Coke and drinking a milkshake. And you can see that they're a little bit, it's a little bit stronger signal for the coat versus the milkshake, but it's very similar. The middle slide with a lot more light up is actually someone being told to think about drinking Coke. And all of the sort of like uh, learning and educational and habit-based centers of the brain just start lighting up. And the fact of the matter is, is that food is the one thing that we're naturally addicted to. We are actually evolved around eating and food has, you know, the act of eating, what we're eating, the memories of eating, and the uh, feelings about eating are wired into almost every cell of our body. It is, it is something that nobody can get away from. It is, a, it is naturally something that you cannot stop talking about. <laughs> and that is what has really been made the difference uh, for us in this food, in the food technology business. Uh, we feel that the opportunity is really special because it's something that everybody in the world can rightfully say they're an expert at, and everybody can get involved. So, okay. So, uh, the market, as a, as a business person, the market is very different. I'm going to compare this to biofuels. Biofuels is a, is, is a movement that is nearly dead. It it died about 15, 10 years ago. The whole idea there was to produce recycle, you know, closed cycle carbon fuels from fermentation, but the problem was is that the uh, global petroleum market is completely controlled by the top companies. Uh, the top 10 companies by revenue control 75% of the global revenue of petroleum. 
And if they don't want something to happen, they'll just simply change the market so it doesn't. And what happened is they dropped the price of oil uh, uh, for several reasons, but one effect was it killed the biofuel project. There's a little bit still going on. It will in the end succeed, but it's gonna take a lot longer and be a lot higher than people were hoping originally. Food, by, in contrast, is an incredibly democratizing global market. Uh, some, I have some numbers sh show me that there's like 250,000 food companies on the face of the earth. Uh, I think it might be more than that. But if you total up, even though there is a, the food companies that at the top are really large, if you add their revenues together, the $12 trillion global food market, it's probably $14 trillion this year, they only control about three or 4% of the total revenues of food because food is local. Food is, food is the universal human right. There is only, there are very few governments, I can only think of one that even comes close to telling people what to eat, right? Every, you know, otherwise you make food, you buy it there. Um, it's the one thing that everybody's allowed to do. And it's just the one thing that probably people are not gonna put up with, with any sort of limitations on. They'll give up a lot of other freedoms, but that's just simply something that, um, that's a lot harder to control. And so that means that small companies with an idea, they can go on to the market and they can be there um, almost immediately. And really even, the, even Nestle or Pepsi will not stop them. They will in fact invest in them as we saw in the previous slides. Uh, most, I, I, you know, I, the, I, and like the most amazing thing as a sustainability person about food is if you make a product you can get it on the shelf in weeks. And the minute somebody picks up that product, instead of buying, if someone picks up your meat sandwich, your vegan meat sandwich compared to a roast beef sandwich or picks up your almond milk uh, instead of buying whole milk, the impact is had right then. It's not a 10 year build, it's not a five year build. Uh, the food industry creates new products rapidly. The markets are used to absorbing them and putting them on the shelves and testing customer acceptance within weeks and months. And so some of these companies, some of these 1100 companies have contributed to greenhouse gas reductions within months of their creation. And uh, we see that, that impact expanding over time. It, so much so that Boston Consulting Group actually wrote a paper, a commission paper that tried to predict when we will reach peak meat, just as there were, we just reached peak population this year in terms of the global population, it should stabilize and start to go down now in many countries it is. Peak meat is the date when we produce the most meat we will ever produce. And then the consumption will go, global consumption goes down. There's estimates that go between 2025, 2030, 2035. It could be sometime in that between now and 2035. It really just depends on how much people like it. Uh, this, these numbers could be really conservative or they can be quite, quite liberal. Uh, it could be as early as next year if everybody changes their mind just decides, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna try this other stuff instead. And so uh, uh, the market's not really predictable this way. It just depends on, completely depends on social phenomenon. And that's, uh, that's why I'm very, very interested as a, as a guest lecturer at, at Santa Clara and sort of in my own work I'm more focused on the market and the people who are buying the meat and the people who are making us, making all this happen, the people who are putting their resources and their time into it because they really, really want it to happen. Uh, the Harvard uh, sociologist, Erica Chenoweth, became famous last year because she had studied a bunch of nonviolent social movements and discovered, uh, basically put out the idea that once three and a half percent of a population really sort of buys into something substantially then the idea starts to change, society starts to change. Uh, and that will that is really what enables policy. It enables financing and money, the kind that Ben and I need. Um, and uh, that's an amazingly low number. Uh, and that is exactly what's happening with food, but it's happening in a way that most of us are unaware of because food uh, is invisible, but it, it's happening nonetheless. So, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with biofuels people and I've worked with pharmaceuticals companies and I work with lots of regular food companies, but I have to tell you, none of them have their own holiday. <laughs> so there's a nonprofit group in the UK. Some people, the younger people may have heard about it. They just call it Veganuary. 
it's a it's it's like Asian American History Month, <laughs> except it's all about just not eating meat. And um, 500,000 people signed up in January this year. Um, it's a UK UK nonprofit, and they popularize the idea. They try to do social networking and and social media for this. Uh, but recent surveys, this has been going on for I think three years. Recent surveys in the UK show that 13% of the people there call themselves vegan and 31% of them call themselves flexitarian, which means that they don't eat meat every day. Uh, that's way above three and a half percent. So uh, all of this is a lot like Black Lives Matter. It's, it's, uh, in, in, in each of them are important in its own ways and necessary in their own way. And they have their own ins and outs. But there's when a social revolution happens, I'm sure some of the audience knows better than me, but when social revolutions happen, there's this sort of like step function that happens where suddenly you have this phase transition. And one, at one minute, there's a total fact and it cannot be changed. And the next is completely different. And that's what I expect we will be seeing when it comes to a social consciousness about meat, uh, what it means and what it can do, which means that the impact for uh, the impact of, of uh, agriculture could be substantially rolled back in terms of greenhouse gas within even a few years. It's possible. And uh, that's an amazing thing to be able to say. That's something that technology doesn't do. Only people do that. Uh, I will just, so I'm going to close with some sort of notes. Uh, all of these, all of these, all of these fast food chains, uh, they've all got vegan options now. And every single one of them ha is, is making deals with Beyond or Impossible or their own, creating their own sort of plant-based chicken. Uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken actually has their own chicken formula they've actually developed themselves. Um, and uh, this is something that as soon as the public is interested, the food industry will completely stand on its head to deliver it. That is what food is. It's very different from uh, another industry that might sort of say, well, we can't afford that. We're not gonna change. You're just gonna do it this way. That is a completely different situation. Um, and it's really, it's really one of the fascinating things that once the public changes their mind, industry will follow it in the blink of an eye. Uh, I'm gonna close with this, uh, this last example. You know, as an activist, as a, as a sort of policy person or activist, I could spend years shouting at dairy industry, talking about the greenhouse gas emissions coming from dairy. But when they start getting pressure from plant-based milks and alternative protein milks, uh, and they're talking about sustainability, uh, then the, the industry comes together and they put out this white paper for 2025, they wanna have a zero carbon impact dairy, okay? So even if people continue to drink milk, uh, all this pressure is just change, it has the potential to change the way everybody's thinking and the way everybody operates in food. It can happen in a very short period of time. It makes me very excited. Um, there have been studies showing that we can get cut out uh, almost all the beef and pork consumption in the world. The greenhouse gas emissions could roll back 18 years. Uh, so this is really, a, really an amazing thing to study and to understand. Um, and the most amazing thing about it to me is that everybody can participate. I think the most powerful thing about this is that people don't feel powerless anymore. What they feel is that they themselves can feel the impact by changing one meal a week. Uh, and they can feel that that's something that they authored, which is something that most of us uh, who've been working in technology, trying to work sustainability, we, we just haven't been able to author that to this, offer that to this point. Uh, and I think that's really the future is a democratization of climate change and a consideration that we're all sort of contributing to it, but we can all solve it together. Right? Uh, I uh, did not cite all of my references, but I'm gonna close by citing, uh, citing a senior thesis, uh, being this crowd being what it is. Uh, you never know, uh, whatever you do, it can be useful. Uh, and you just know, never know what's gonna happen. Okay, I will stop there. And I'm not too far late. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Ron and Ben. Um, so we have some questions that have um, already uh, been put in the chat bar and I'm gonna start asking those. Um, if you have any questions for Ben or Ron, you still have time to put them in the chat um, and we'll make sure to ask them. So I'm gonna get started. Uh, 
So Allison Groves, class of 1999, asks, you mentioned that trees are basically all that is used now for paper, and we hear a lot about hemp as a base product for paper. Is it actually a better material than trees or wood from an environmental standpoint? I'm curious about uh, your perspective on that then. So uh, I don't know a lot about hemp growing. Um, I think one uh, particular point that I would make is that um, I'm, I'm focused on residuals. So the wheat straw is essentially a waste product of growing wheat. Uh, if you grow hemp for the purpose of making paper, um, it's no longer a, a, a residual, it's a, it's a um, you know, direct input. That's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but I don't know what a yield on a hemp, um, on, on hemp versus, you know, like if you, an acre of hemp versus an acre of forests, um, et cetera, you know, they're, 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 they're um, trying to just think and see, see what I could say off the cuff. I mean, one thing about wood is that it is very dense, of course. Um, so it's very efficient to grow it. Um, I think I, um, it's a great question. I don't really have an answer. And, and related to this, uh, Lorna Lyons, uh, uh, class of 1976, said, I have been promoting hemp building. Um, I don't know if that was the word intended in the Pacific Northwest. Have you investigated adding hemp to the straw? Do you see that happening over time? So yeah, really the same thing. I mean, we're, we're very focused on, on residuals. So um, um, I, I, I know some conversations have been had around hemp and there are some um, growers who've had conversations with my business partner. Um, I think it's not happening at nearly the scale. So um, we, uh, um, Columbia Pulp is gonna use 230,000 tons per year of straw at, I mean, that's its design capacity. And so that's about, um, um, you know, so 230,000 tons per year on a three year rotation, you figure that's about 700,000 acres and some portion of the land Actually, you can't take the straw off. So you've got a million acres of wheat uh, being grown in order to feed that plant. And I think the quantities of hemp that are grown currently are you know, just minute compared to that. So wheat is a volume product. And so it works well for a volume manufacturing requirement. Um, but again, I mean, I, I think there, if, if we have a million acres of hemp, I think it would be great to, to, to put it into a bulk milk. So David Snyder, class of 1965, and uh, Elizabeth Jarrison Terry had similar question with regard to bamboo, um, wondering about what you know uh, in terms of its impacts um, and um, how good a um, base pulp material it is for the things that we're talking about. Yeah, so, so um, the, um, again, there's the issue of, is it a, um, are you taking a waste uh, uh, that would otherwise be you know, burned or tilled or whatever, um, which is what Columbia Pulp is doing. So that's a benefit of the, of the wheat straw. However, um, I think bamboo has some tremendous advantages in that it's extremely fast growing. As, as we know, there are certain species that grow at an astonishing rate. And so um, um, the problem with, with, um, with using trees is of course, you know, very long growth cycles. And um, so, you know, yeah, you just you you have a much more a much larger land impact, and uh, there's certainly a lot of people making bamboo-based papers. Uh, I uh, we that's not something we've considered ourselves, uh, and and I'm not involved in that part of the industry at all. But I think it's a it is certainly a great alternative to fiber. Yes. Uh, let's see, Rachel Fredericks, class of 2004, uh, has a question for Ben. For those of us who have no connection to industry, what can we do to support the sorts of industrial interventions, especially retrofits that you discussed? Legislative proposals we can support, organizations we can donate to, projects we can invest in, ways to find those. So, great question, thank you. I think um, as Ron is talking about with me, um, you know, consumers have a tremendous amount of power. And I think a really great place to start is to just think about what you're buying and, and look to see if there's an alternative. And if you know some of the, the consequences, for instance, I mentioned the issue of bleaching. Buy brown paper, you know, buy white paper because it doesn't, it doesn't need to be bleached. Or, um, buy, um, look for recycled fiber content, certainly. Um, I think as far as uh, policy, you know, um, 
part of the challenge around energy projects has to do with uh, the fact that many utilities are pretty recalcitrant. Um, not always out of, um, you know, sort of uh, old, old, old line thinking or, you know, lack of caring, but they're just big bureaucracies. They're highly regulated and, um, and, and it is an economic threat to them. You know, if we put a 20 megawatt power plant into the, um, into the cement mill, then that's 20 megawatts that that cement plant isn't buying from the utility anymore. So it has a direct impact on them. So um, if you're in any kind of a position to look for and influence um, public policy around, for instance, how utilities get compensated, uh, if utilities can get compensated not for, uh, not for owning assets, but for having assets within their territory that are renewable. Um, boy, you know, that's, it, it's a great question, a huge, big topic. Um, um, but I, I think great points of intervention are one, what do you buy? And, um, and two, uh, I, th I think utility related regulation is, is, a, is an important, um, and, and not, uh, not um, blocking utilities or forcing things on utilities exclusively, but also um, supporting ways in which their business model can change uh, as the future comes at us, because the world of energy is changing a lot for them and it's, it's frightening for them. Uh, thank you. Uh, David Snyder, class of 1965, asked Ron, won't the same folks who are against genetically modified food products oppose lab-produced substitutions for animal protein products? And he says, I realize this is a culture war issue, not a scientific one. No, oh, well, that's, that's very valid. So the answer is yes, some people absolutely will despise it and they will never buy it. Um, we don't need everybody to love it. Uh, I think what's going to happen, what we're seeing is there's generational attitude changes. Uh, the younger people are surveying that they're gonna, they're gonna adopt this meat, they're gonna enjoy it, uh, and they look forward to it, and they're starting most of the companies. Uh, and that's probably enough. I, you know, I think that, uh, th I think the important thing is there's enough market force here to make these substantially real. Um, and what you're gonna get is a lot of kids taking their parents and grandparents out to lunch and saying, you know, look at this burger, it's exactly the same. I've actually sat in a vegan cafe down here in Berkeley and actually watch this happen. Uh, it's just a bunch of skeptical older people being dragged in by their kids. Uh, and, 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 and that's kind of how the social network seeps into uh, at you from different dimension directions. But I mean, there will some people who, 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 who disapprove of this, but I do believe long-term the attitude toward GMO will change. Uh, GMO has been not been properly conscious of the customer and their understanding and their feelings about food. And as a new generation of products change that, and as people perceive that they are healthier because they eat these products, that will also change the perception towards GMO. Uh, Paul has a question uh, for Ron. So you, um, so how closely is that 3.5% number related to social media? Um, so, and I seen a bit of a discussion about this in the chat bar. So it looks like some people have tried to answer that, but we'd love to There's hear some really good thoughts. answers in the chat bar. I hope that yeah. <laughs> I'm not a sociologist, but Chenoweth's numbers come from pre-social media data often. Uh, they're not all Arab Spring data, right? It actually goes back to civil rights, I think, and things like this. Um, and of course, as we, the, some of the audience are real connoisseurs here, I, I can see that. And the dynamics of the actual social processes involved will shift that number and change the amount of time it takes uh, for these changes to happen. You know, they're not gonna protest in the street about vegan food uh, or plant-based food, but uh, probably it's gonna be slower because it's gonna be having people over for dinner and sharing food, which is also much, it's much, much more toward the nonviolent side. It's actually more socially warm and welcoming. Um, and that, that should give it a completely different sort of means of transmission, but I hope it's just as effective, one would think. Uh, another question for Ron from Nancy and Ken Einhorn. My understanding is growing almonds also takes a lot of water. What dairy cow alternative to milk is the best for low water and greenhouse gas impacts? You know, Oatly's, oat-based milks are real popular now and they taste good. Um, but I'll tell you this advocacy, this sort of advocacy by market that Ben's talking about really works. Like. 
you know, we had a drought even a few years ago. We're gonna have another drought in California now. And the almond growers have all changed. They've started planting the trees closer together. And then the 50, 50 uh, gallons per almond number is no longer true. Uh, I don't know how low they'll get it and the costs are gonna be significant. Uh, but, um, uh, but uh, uh, you know, just keep, yeah, you know, keep looking for good answers, buy your oat milk, but uh, everybody's gonna try to get more efficient because that's what you want. Uh, and if you keep asking for it, it's gonna show up. Uh, Catherine Radica, a uh, class of 1992, um, has a couple of questions. One for Ben. You mentioned you could talk about the project development part of your work. Uh, she's interested in hearing about that. Please comment if you have some time. Yeah, so um, one slide I didn't get to had a quote on it, which I'm very fond of, which um, it's a colleague of mine, a guy named Bill Hunter, who has a company called Air Clean Energy, so a contractor who installs a lot of these systems. And his quote is, our biggest competitor is doing nothing. And um, so the role of a project developer is to make something happen in the face of a great deal of disinterest and inertia when you're working with a retrofit. That it's different with a, um, with a greenfield project like Columbia Pulp. So the Columbia Pulp project is, you know, just starting from nothing and, 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 uh, and building out a mill. So there the, the challenges are more around um, capitalization, around you know, getting the financing for the project. Um, so you have to do a lot of work to get the various components in place um, in order to, to, to attract the financing. But on the retrofit side, um, when you're trying to intervene at an existing facility, not just to intervene in an industry, but intervene at a facility, you know, I think a lot of project developers make the mistake of getting too excited about their own project and believing in the importance of their project. And they forget that they are unimportant. Um, you know, if you're, if you're running a cement plant, a giant cement plant, it's making, you know, millions of tons of cement every year. And you know, somebody comes in and says, I want to, you know, make you $3 million a year in, in, in savings or, 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 or direct payments. You know, you, you, first of all, you have to give them a number that's big enough. You have to like know, and that's going to be scaled to the size of the facility that you, you have to make it economically attractive. If there are other levers, great, but it's been my experience that um, they, are, they are sometimes necessary, but never sufficient. The, 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 um, the you know, let's say PR impact, if I want to be cynical about it. Uh, but the, um, 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 there's a lot of fear around bringing an outside project onto your facility. Uh, the facility will not do it themselves because they typically have at best a three-year simple payback, meaning you have to have a project with like a 25% plus annualized return, which is, you know, occasionally you come across a project like that, but most of these are, are more utility scale type returns. Um, so, um, so getting over that inertia and getting over the fear and, um, and then just being really patient and you have to simultaneously operate in your developer's alternate reality sphere and believe that everything is going to go wonderfully and, and you just, and it's a, the best project in the world and be very realistic and very zen about the fact that you're going to have days when it all falls apart and, and then there's the, there's the one day every three years when you say, woohoo, we did it. And then, you, uh, uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I find it to be very satisfying because there's a sort of a, a, a creative element to the work because you're, um, there's a lot of communications and you have to think on your feet, you know, you'll be in some contract negotiation, something will be thrown at you and you have to adjust to it. Um, um, you have to create, create um, a path that will work for all of the stakeholders. And um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll pause there, but there's my... There's, there, there's a little. I have a question for you, man. Like, are you seeing an attitude change in the capital equity people? Because uh, I think what's happening is there is a shift in their feelings about things, and that might change the dynamic for projects like yours and the one discussed here. Yeah, you know, just to give you a couple of example or an example, um, the Columbia Pulp project um, was um, the placement agent was Goldman Sachs. They did the they, they did a bond offering and. I certainly think the fact that it was a green project attracted them to it and made them work harder on it. Would they have done it even if it was just a 
you know, gas fired power plant or something, you know, probably, but I think, I think there was, there was, there's some technology risk in the project and there's um, market risk, offtake risk, um, because it's a new technology and a new, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty new thing to be built at that kind of scale. And I think, um, I think the green attributes helped um, motivate them to, to put their name on it. Uh, uh, I think very recently, like in the last six months, I think the momentum is starting to pick up um, further. Uh, there's a um, the ESG designation on bonds is you know is becoming more important. Um, I don't happen to have a project in industry that's sort of in financing right now, so I'm not experiencing it directly. But certainly anecdotally, it feels like it's um, like there is some some momentum around that. I I would still say for me, it's a matter of picking of understanding what little bucket of money you can most effectively go after. Yeah, I'd like to add that venture capital is changing quite a bit too. If you had got that attitude, maybe even a year ago, I would recheck. Um, but, you know, like Ben's saying, understanding what they want, what their parameters are, is really important. Unfortunately, manufacturing infrastructure, not something venture capital is really very interested in. Uh, but I have the work with I have worked with infrastructure companies and they can find their way. It's a lot harder road to hope. Um, so I just want to do a time check. We have about four minutes left um, in our session, so we may not get through all the questions. However, if our presenters uh, Ron and Ben are okay with staying another fifteen minutes, we might be able to extend it. I'm happy to. Happy to. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, this is the second question from Catherine. Um, I'm working with startups in renewable energy, carbon capture, and electrification of industry. One common barrier is the funding for scale-up experiments to demonstrate that a technology can move from lab prototypes to industrial scale. Not mature enough for venture, capital, venture capitalists and traditional investors, but too big for research grants. Have you encountered this, and what are your thoughts on how to close the scalability gap? I think, I, I think it just depends on the startup. I think, I think the venture capital is there but you have to present it in the proper way. I think everybody should listen to Ben when he said like, it can't just be an improvement. It's just like saying like, just imagine some company you say like, there's this whole new better kind of clothes that just work a whole lot better. Like you're gonna feel 10% more comfortable or you have to wash them every other time, you know, like you wash them 10% less in the year or you'll save like 5% or more. You're just not even gonna be able to think in terms of like that, does that sound like a thing? It has to be so clearly an advantage, though, that it overcomes the fear of risks and all the expenses of changing things. And so it, it has to be has to be a substantial improvement. And when, by substantial, I think Ben and I are both thinking 100% better, you know. And so that's that is the real challenge with innovation. Uh, Rachel Fredericks, class of 2004, says, I'm an ethicist who has been researching why people find it difficult to or are unwilling to reduce or give up meat. And it seems that when you eat meat daily, specifically as a child, and thus have lots of memories and cultural associations and habits relating to meat, it is identity threatening to adjust dietary habits. What are your thoughts on how to prevent the meat addiction early in life rather than waiting until bad habits have already formed? I think a lot of households tend to like have their kids eating differently than than we did at our at, at, at when we were ra being raised. It, it's you know mom and dad are everything, and they can make tremendous amounts of change. Forcing your kids to be vegan may not turn out super well uh, because, as we all know, as readies, people tend to rebel, uh, and so it's really about the relationship that you have with them. Um, but there is a whole peer group out there uh, that they will encounter in this generation that will sort of like want them to be help them build their own habits that are healthier. And if you encourage that, you know, I have two young kids and I, I, I have no idea where they're gonna end up, but I just want them to understand. I guess that's the best you can do with kids. However, there is a generational change. And as someone who studies that, you can see that there are lots of forces moving everybody. And I think that's a great thing to understand. You know, from one case to the next, you have no hope, <laughs> right? Uh, Kellen asks, I would love a heme veggie burger that doesn't include legumes like beans or peas. Does this exist? Not yet. Not yet. It will. Uh, yeah. um, the, the heme is going to be, the heme is under patent. And so only Impossible is using it at this point. 
but the technology will get out and other, other products will have it. And, uh, um, and so eventually there will be some for everybody, uh, but it will take time. And a related question from Mark McLean, class of 1970. What about allergies and food intolerance, soy, peanuts, gluten, lactose? Can these be programmed around in food synthesis? Absolutely. I mean, the, it's just a matter, I mean, right now, what, what, what was started with two or three startups about six years ago, making, trying to make food for the general market is now differentiating into thousands of companies. And when you get that, you will start getting people serving all these different niche interests. Um, it will take some time, but there are cafes here in Berkeley, especially restaurants that will serve vegan free meat, faux meat. Um, and uh, it just sort of depends on your location and uh, your patients. But uh, that if you live in New York City or, or the Bay Area, you know, you've already, you're going to get served now. Later on, the package will show up at your Walmart. Uh, and Roderick Bauer, along those lines, said impossible uses soy, correct? They, I believe they do at this point. Okay. Uh, Emma Rowe, class of 2006, says, uh, being a person who's from rural Vermont, I have watched the only successful family dairy farmers become successful because they've transitioned to organic dairy products. In places like Vermont, where there's very little industry and not a lot of economic opportunities incentivizing young people to remain in the state, a lot of people are actually going into projects including animal husbandry and organic dairy farming. Over the past 15 years, there's been a huge boom in the agricultural sector in Vermont, including producers of artisan cheeses, yogurts, and milk products. Producers. I don't know if the carbon impact has increased over this time period. Do you have any thoughts about agricultural issues like these in rural places in the U.S. like Vermont? I think, you know, I think we all need to think about the farmers, but I, I think that the farmers are, we're at the end of a very long process. You know, over the past hundred years, the cost of food as, you know, even taking into consideration inflation has been dropping for hundred years. And now it's starting to slowly move upwards. And that ha is having a profound effect on how we feel about our food. And part of the reason that it's been getting cheaper is people have been squeezing the farmers and paying them less for their work uh, over time. And that's why there have been so many problems with farmers. And so while this is gonna be, this is going to sort of put even more pressure on some of the animal husbandry type farms, what's gonna happen is that some of the farmers will convert to making non-animal based products and others will move up market. So the people who've gone organic, they've already sort of smelled that and they had the resources, fortunately, to sort of move themselves up market. They're gonna make higher quality products and they're gonna charge more for them and they can make a greater profit at the same time. I think the one thing you don't wanna do when the land is shifting under you is to do exactly what you've been doing. I think that uh, I think if what we see is that when farmers pay attention to the future market and they make investments in change, that they can sort of they can sort of find another way. That's not a really welcome welcome point of view, but I mean, we're all we're all seeing change now, and I'm uh, I'm afraid we're all going to be experiencing that in common. Uh, Kellen asks. For Ron, do you have any advice for getting into consulting? I feel it is a natural fit for readies who learn quickly, analyze information effectively, and connect ideas in divergent fields. And not to mention having a short attention span. It is also very good for consulting. However, um, you know, uh, but the, the, the honest answer is that you have to, if you have a service and some experience that people can use, then you can consult. And so the question is, what are you doing for them? Uh, and it, unfortunately, I'll tell you from personal experience, I started, I had none of that and it took me a little while to get it. So you have to be patient with yourself and that's your long-term goal. Uh, you can do it, but you have to, you have to accumulate that experience, I think. Yeah, if I could, I would just, I would really echo that. I think, um, Ron, I think what you said there about what can you do for them is just super important. I mean, I, I haven't done a, a ton of consulting, but we used to consult at the industrial recycling company. We did a good bit of consulting for for, um, for big heavy industry and for some um, capital providers too, for some high net worth family office type folks. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's, if you come in wanting to solve the problem, wanting to help, um, it, it just, um, as, as a client, I feel it, you know, I feel the difference between a consultant 
who is like excited about my problem, uh, you know, as a problem. And, and I think that's where actually, I think Reedy's, I mean, as a big generalization, Reedy's do tend to get excited about problems and how to fix them. And so, you know, I think, I think that's a secret oven because I think there are, I've encountered a lot of consultants also who are looking to build the hours and you can feel it. And, and um, if you have that expertise and that enthusiasm, I think you can, um, you can find places to, um, to deploy them. And I guess there's a big question about whether you go into a specific industry and gain some of the experience that you'll need to consult and then go and consult or whether you go to a consulting firm. Um, I haven't, I've not done that. I've never worked for a, cons uh, you know, for Boston consulting or whatever, but, but um, uh, my, my feeling is get, get specialized first before you consult. Yeah. Well said. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, follow up um, from Kellen on that. Would you say it's a chicken and egg problem to get experience and do you have any advice for that? It's a chicken and egg, sorry. Could you yeah, that was what I was, yeah. I, Kellen, maybe you can um, elaborate in the chat. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I think maybe what Kellen's saying, if I could give it a crack, take a crack at it is, um, you have to get experience in order to get working. You have to get work in order to get experience. And um, um, you know, how do you get experience in a field? Um, I, I mean, I guess I would say maybe consulting is a good thing to come to at a point in your career when you feel like you have a mass of specialization that you can deploy. And so then, how do you get that? I think it's you know picking a Picking an industry, well, where you there is a there. There is one thing though, Beth. Like when you're really young and you're just getting out of grad school, there's about six months when you're fresh enough that, that you can go work for a consulting firm, firm, like Accenture, right? And people who go do that, and if you want to consult and, and nothing else, <laughs> you can be a consultant your entire life by going to work for someone like that, and they will sell you as a consultant, sort of train you to be a consultant, but it'll be a very particular kind. You know, um, but, you know, so you can sort of take a straight path there, uh, but uh, you know, you, there are a lot of people, I don't know, you, then you have to figure out how you stand out because there's quite a few people who pass through that route. I wanna, I, wanna, I, I see a lot of people talking about soy and pea and, and, and can we use vertical farming to make these meats and stuff. I, I just wanna just say really quickly, it's really, if you go to Trader Joe's and you look at a, a, like a vegan sandwich and a non-vegan sandwich next to it. The vegetarian sandwich costs more. And so the fact that meat is so heavily subsidized is a real problem. And so if you wanna make a burger, which is gonna try to even somewhere get near cost parity for beef, you have to use pea and soy because it's so bloody cheap. If you can find someone else, something else that doesn't cost, cost that, that much, you can make a great burger with it that would be super, but the reason we have so much soy, there's a lot of, also a lot of wheat gluten. That's not a great look for a, for a food, but there's, there's food, there are meats that are basically nothing but wheat gluten. And uh, it just, it's this cost problem. <clears throat> so anybody solves that problem, you'll do really well. Uh, it looks like we have a question from Paul. I don't know if this was addressed, um, and, um, if you saw this one, Ron. Uh, is there a role for indoor or controlled environment agriculture and plant-based meat or alternative production? Yeah, well, if you can get the efficiency to produce something indoors, uh, then, then, but you have to sell it. Whatever you grow indoors, you have to sell it for a profit because if you sell for a loss, you'll just simply not be there in another year. Right now, vertical farming, indoor farming is really poised to focus on things like microgreens, lettuces, things that cost a lot per pound uh, and can grow relatively rapidly. It's fairly narrow kind of technology where they have an advantage over growing in the field. Um, and so once you start to understand that, you can sort of imagine how it's a little hard to, to make a beef patty out of something that grows inside because you need a lot of mass and you need to be very cheap. But it's a problem that someone should solve, right? I would love that. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, 
Ron and Ben, this has been a fantastic presentation. I've learned a lot. Um, I hope other people feel the same way. And I, I really love that it's, we're not just talking about the innovation. We're not just talking about the science we're talk and, and you know, the business side of it, we're talking about social movements and change and eco ecological change that's required to really make this happen. So um, yeah, uh, thank you all for participating in the Q&A, such great questions. Um, I believe Ben and Ron were fine with us um, pro providing these slides. So for some of you who would like to go back and reference them, um, we'll make them available to people who attended. Um, so that's the end of our session. Um, in about an hour and a half, well, an hour and 15 minutes, 